Well, you know, when I talk about dinosaurs, I have a lot of people ask a question. They say, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? And you know, sometimes the answer that I give surprises a lot of people. The answer is you don't. I caught your attention, didn't I? <laughs> well, here's what it is. A lot of people, they say, well, let's take these ideas about dinosaurs, let's try to fit it into the Bible somewhere. We don't want to do that. You have to be very careful about that because a lot of times when you take dinosaurs, you're taking a lot of other aspects and elements and belief systems about dinosaurs and they're trying to force fit that into the Bible. I don't want to do that. I want to do something different. I want to step back and I want to use the Bible as the framework by which we look at dinosaurs. Uh, almost like you're using the, the Bible as lenses, like glasses, uh, to look at dinosaurs. So you don't try to fit dinosaurs into the Bible, but here's what you do do. You try to explain dinosaurs using the Bible. Let the Bible be the absolute authority, not our preconceived notions about dinosaurs. So really, we want to use the Bible uh, as reality glasses. When we look through the lenses of Scripture, we're looking at the world the way that God looks at the world. And that's kind of important to us because that gives us a proper understanding of the world. When you reject God and His Word, well, you're stuck with nothing, really. But when you start with God and his word, we can understand reality so much better. You know, just basic concepts. Why do we wear clothes? Because of an event that happened back in the past, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Why is there a seven-day week? Well, because God created everything and rested on the seventh. That's why we have a week. That's why cultures all around the world actually have a week. Why does marriage exist? Well, because God created a man and a woman. You see, when we start with the Bible, it actually makes sense of the world. And so when we look at dinosaurs, we want to start with the Bible, use the Bible as the framework to look at dinosaurs. Now, dinosaurs are land animals, so they were created on day six of creation. We've already talked about that in the previous session, but I kind of want to remind people of that. So some people out there watching, this might be your first one. So dinosaurs are land animals. Uh, uh, if you actually look at uh, flying reptiles or, or sea creatures like uh, some of the sea reptiles, like plesiosaurs, things like that, they would have actually not been considered technically dinosaurs, but in a layman's sense, we sometimes lump those in. But dinosaurs are land animals created on the sixth day of creation. If we jump back in the Bible, Genesis 1, verses 24 through 25, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. See, this is part of the sixth day of creation. Beasts of the earth, that includes your dinosaurs here. So dinosaurs are land animals. They were created on day six. Guess what? Man was also created on day six. Both were created on the sixth day of creation. So they would have been living at the same time. And that surprises a lot of people in our culture because a lot of people... They, they've got this mindset because they've been influenced by the world that man and dinosaurs are separated by long periods of time. But according to scripture, they were both made on the sixth day of creation. So I know that's kind of a new concept to a lot of people out there. Uh, especially, I, I've had people come up and they say, but Bodie, aren't, aren't fossils millions of years old? Those dinosaur fossils in particular, aren't they millions of years old? Actually, they're not. You see, people have been influenced by the world. They get this idea of millions of years from rock layers. They're not looking in light of biblical reality glasses. They are thinking in terms of millions and billions of years that come from the secular world. You see, dinosaurs and man live side by side. Dinosaurs are not millions of years old. It comes from the idea of rock layers being evidence of millions and billions of years. Let me explain this. When people looked at these rock layers, and if you look at some of these rock layers down here, Let's see if I can get this to pop up on you. You see these rock layers? They assume these rock layers were laid down slowly and gradually over long periods of time. Slow, gradual accumulations over millions and billions of years. Now, why did people do that? Because they rejected the Bible. See, according to the Bible, there was a massive worldwide global flood over the course of about a year. Billions of dead things, varying rock layers laid down by water over the earth. And see, that's what we see when we look at things like the Grand Canyon here, some of these images. And of course, we can find canyons and these rock layers all over the world. But people rejected God and his word. They said, let's leave the Bible out of it. Well, as soon as you leave the Bible out of it, you left God out of it. So God is no longer seen as the absolute authority on the subject of rock layers. So by default, man becomes the authority. Man's ideas are elevated then to supersede God and his word. 
That's actually the religion of humanism in its broadest sense where man is seen essentially as God, replacing God. And that's how people started looking at these rock layers. So they started to say, wow, these rock layers, if we just look at them, they don't form very fast. You can watch them all day long. Huh, these rock layers aren't forming very fast. Well, they assume these rock layers will lay down slowly, gradually, over millions and billions of years. That's where that idea came from. It actually comes out of the religion of humanism. In fact, we can follow this trend in history. Buffon estimated the age of the earth at about 78,000 years. And uh, Abraham Werner come along, said about a million years. A lot of people had long ages, but it really culminates with a man named Charles Lyell. In the 1830s, he wrote three books called The Principles of Geology, where he declared those rock layers being evidence of slow, gradual accumulations over millions of years, and uh, it kind of gradually goes up. People keep upping the date. I know that very bottom one there, it looks like it's kind of cutting off on my screen. It's probably cutting off on yours, but that bottom one is 1956. Claire Patterson was the first one to declare the age of the earth about 4.5 billion years, and that's what we see even today. So that's actually a modern, brand new idea. Now, I've had people say, well, who's got the most evidence when it comes to looking at the age of the earth? Is it, is it those creationists? Is it those evolutionists? Who is it? Who has the most evidence? Actually, we all have the same evidence. We're looking at the same rock layers. We're looking at the same dinosaur bones. We're looking at the same DNA. We're looking at the same evidence. Now, see, I used to think, boy, if I could get more evidences into my wheelbarrow, boy, I'm going to win. But now it has nothing to do with that. We're looking at the same evidence. The difference is the interpretation of that evidence. See, me as a Christian, I want to start with the Word of God when I look at any piece of evidence, whether it's dinosaur bones, uh, whether it's oceans or continents or, or starlight or whatever it is. I want to start with God and His Word. That's the way I want to look at it. I want to put those biblical reality glasses on. But what's the world doing, okay? They've rejected God and His Word, so by default, man becomes the authority, and that's the glasses that they're using to look at. So we have two different worldviews. Now, I've had people come up and say, oh, Bodie, let's look at these rock layers. But how about, how about you leave the Bible out of it? You know what they're saying in a very subtle sense? They're saying, get rid of your authority and trust mine. Well, if a Christian gives up the Bible, they've automatically lost the debate, haven't they? Because God's no longer seen as the absolute authority on the subject of rock layers. If this Christian were to object and say, you know, these rock layers, boy, they could have been laid down by a gigantic flood. I, I, I. You left the Bible out of it. So all of a sudden, you get caught in a trap. This is essentially what happened to a lot of Christians, particularly in the late 17, and the, particularly the 1800s, and that, that's when it really happened the most. The idea of these rock layers being evidence of millions of years instead of being flood sediment was presented to a lot of Christians. And sadly, a lot of Christians said, oh, okay, well, let's just take that millions of years. Let's try to fit it into the Bible somewhere. See what happens when you try to fit stuff into the Bible? They took rock layers, which do exist, but they took the man-made ideas about those rock layers. They tried to put them in the Bible. Well, where do you put millions of years in there? It just doesn't fit. We have a continuous lineage from Adam all the way to Christ in Luke chapter 3. Where do you put millions of years? You can't fit it in that genealogy. I mean, nobody tries to put millions of years between Mary and Jesus. <laughs> It'd be the longest labor in the history of the world. So people said, oh, well, here's what we got to do. If we're going to put millions of years in the Bible, we got to go all the way back to the very beginning before Adam. And all of a sudden, Genesis chapter 1 became one of the most controversial chapters in the entire Bible. We had some Christians say, well, maybe you could put millions of years out here uh, before, before time existed. How, how can you have millions of years of time before time exists? That doesn't make any sense. That's actually illogical. A Scottish theologian named Thomas Chalmers said, let's take Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2. Let's just separate it out, put a big gap in there. Let's put all that millions of years in there, and let's just not worry about it. He just didn't want to deal with it. But of course, you run into all sorts of problems with that. He actually thought, well, maybe that's when Satan fell. Maybe that's when you have a Luciferian flood. Of course, you've got big problems with that. What about day age or progressive creation? They take the days of creation, they stretch them out to be millions and billions of years long. Sometimes the days overlap. Sometimes they rearrange the days. And then you have theistic evolution or framework hypothesis, some of these variations, Walton's view and so forth, where they basically take Genesis chapter 1 up to Genesis chapter 11, reinterpret it so heavily 
that it just doesn't mean what it says. And so you just replace it with big bang, millions of years in evolution. But what are you doing? What are you doing to the Bible? Well, you're putting a gap in it, stretching it out, reinterpreting it all for one reason. You're trying to take man-made ideas about rock layers and force fit that into the Bible. Trying to put it all in there right there before Adam. But as soon as you do that, you run into a problem. It's a huge problem. It's a gigantic theological problem. Because what do you see in those rock layers? Well, you see evidence of pain, death, killing, thorns, disease, struggling, suffering, extinction. We see animals eating other animals. We find uh, cancer in the fossil record. We find all sorts of terrible things. And we're trying to take all that, put it into Genesis chapter 1. Here's the problem. At the end of the creation week, God saw all that he had made, and indeed it was very good. That's a huge problem. If you put millions of years into Genesis chapter 1, all of a sudden death becomes good. Suffering becomes good. Cancer becomes good. If Satan had fallen between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, that makes Satan in his sinful state very good. In fact, that makes sin very good. These are huge theological problems. Imagine Adam and Eve. Oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. Yes, Eve, it's very good, just like God said. And it's sitting on top of millions of years of death, pain, struggling, suffering, extinction, and cancer, and tuberculosis, and all sorts of other diseases we find in the fossil record. It makes absolutely no sense. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee. That was part of the curse. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, cursed is the ground because of man, both thorns and thistles came forth. And yet, in the fossil record, we find thorns all over in there. Some of them at very low levels. The Devonian Rock, named for Devonshire, England. They say that's 400 million years old. We find thorns in it. No, no, no. That rock layer, those thorns in it, and the rock layer sitting on top had to come after Adam and Eve sinned against God. Otherwise, they couldn't exist because thorns and thistles did not exist until after Adam and Eve sinned. Hey, the flood of Noah's day makes perfect sense of these rock layers, don't they? They occurred in the days of Noah, which was well after Adam and Eve had sinned. We expect to see death in the rock layer then. We expect to see suffering and cancer and, and thorns and all sorts of things like that. But if you put millions of years of death, pain, struggling, and suffering into Genesis chapter 1, you are tarnishing God's statement that everything is very good. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, every work of God is perfect. His works are perfect here. They really are. We expected a perfect creation, not a world marred with death, bloodshed, and suffering. It really was perfect. In the New Testament, the last enemy that should be destroyed is death, according to 1 Corinthians. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. You see, the punishment for sin is death. Sin is serious in the sight of God. It brought death. The entire set of rock layers that contain death in it are a record of things that occurred after sin entered into the world. Romans chapter 8, we note the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. See, this is why we need a new heavens and a new earth. But when you look at those rock layers, you look at the Grand Canyon, think in terms of the Bible's history. God is the one that's always right. The world has been marred with sin and a global flood that came in and demolished and annihilated and rearranged everything. So when you look at the Grand Canyon, think biblically. Put those biblical glasses on when you look at the world. The layers contain dead things. Death came what? Before or after sin. According to the Bible, it was after sin. So the rock layers had to form after Adam and Eve sinned against God. Now, the majority of those rock layers were laid down by the flood. We've had rock layers since that time, local catastrophes and so forth. I've had people say, but Bodhi, it takes millions of years to form rock. How do they know that? Seriously, that's a great question. Has anybody ever observed millions of years of rock formation? No, they haven't. But we have a lot of examples of rapid rock. Here's a clock in a rock. Can't beat that one. That's a good one. Concrete, that didn't take millions of years to form. You see, the point is there is a battle in our culture, and this is important to the subject of dinosaurs because people are looking at dinosaurs from two different viewpoints, two different historical perspectives, two different religions, two entirely different worldviews. You're either starting with God and his word, and there is no greater authority than God. There isn't. Or if you reject God, man becomes your God. And that's the battle we have. One history that says millions and billions of years leads up to man's existence, but if we start with the Bible, a perfect God makes perfect creation, and it's because of man's sin that death and suffering came into the world. You see, it's a battle over two different religions, two different authorities, man versus God. And it leads to two different things. Christianity versus humanism. 
One leads to life, one leads to death. But you know, in our culture, the secular forms of humanism are dominating our culture. Anytime you see Big Bang, millions of years of revolution, these are subsets to the religion of humanism in the same way that creation, the fall, and the flood are subsets to the religion of Christianity. You see, it's a battle over two different worldviews. And in our culture, there's a lot of forms of secularism out there. This is religious. There's secularism, secular humanism, atheism, which says there's no God, new atheism, which is a very aggressive form of atheism. Try to impose it onto kids. Agnosticism is a religion that says you can't know if God exists. It's a fascinating religion when you actually look at it. With agnosticism, you can't know if God exists, but if you look closely at that religion, you can't know if knowledge exists. So you can't really know if you can or can't know if God exists. It's fascinating. Hey, even when people say they're not religious, they say they're neutral, that's a fancy way of saying they're a humanist because they've already rejected God and his word in light of their own ideas. Naturalism, that nature is all that there is, that there's no supernatural, that's, that's a religion. New age, any worldview that devi deviates from God and his word, one way or another, have humanistic elements in it. What gets me is when many Christians, Christians want to take some of the secular world's ideas and they want to bring it over and try to fit it in the Bible. They do this not just with humanism and the origins account. They also want to do it with dinosaurs. How many times has Genesis chapter 1 been cut up? Because people have a false view of dinosaurs. You have to have a correct understanding of dinosaurs. So you have to start with the Bible to look at dinosaurs to get that correct understanding. See, dinosaurs were created on day 6. Flying reptiles, sea reptiles, they were made on day 5. They live contemporaneously with humans. And they have died out since that time, just like hosts of other animals have died out. We're in a sin-cursed and broken world. We expect to see things die. But that was only after Adam and Eve sinned against God. Well, is there any evidence that confirms that man and dinosaurs live together? Actually, we have quite a bit. Let me uh, explain some of these. These are called petroglyphs, cave drawings, etchings, things like that. We find in various parts of the world. Uh, for example, uh, here's a petroglyph. Uh, this is actually out of Havasupai Canyon. It's one of the side canyons off the Grand Canyon. And uh, this uh, creature looks surprisingly similar to an Edmontosaurus uh, type of dinosaur. So it's kind of a fascinating one here. Uh, here's another. This is uh, out at Natural Bridges National Monument. This creature looks surprisingly similar to a sauropod type of dinosaur. Now this one has stirred up all sorts of controversy out there in the secular world because... Well, you're not supposed to have a dinosaur and a man living together if you follow the religion of secular humanism. That is the evolutionary uh, atheistic worldview. Now, I know, like I said, a lot of Christians try to, try to take their origins account, try to mix it with their Christianity, which is a, a very sad testimony, actually. But uh, this is a fascinating uh, looking petroglyph here. Here's another one out at San Rafael Swell in Utah. I mean, look at this creature. It looks kind of like a flying reptile. Now, I wouldn't be absolutely adamant about it, but uh, it definitely fits the description. Here's one up in uh, Canada, uh, Ontario, specifically at Lake Superior. You can even see a boat over here in the background. You see, uh, see that boat right there? And then you see this dinosaur-like creature. It's got something along the back of their neck. A number of dinosaurs had features like that. One of my favorites is over at Carlisle Cathedral in northern England. A man named Bishop Bell uh, died uh, around the year 1500, and he's buried in the church and you can see a brassing here. See some of that brass that goes all the way up and around. It's kind of small, and then it comes back down. If you zoom right up to that and look at it really close, you see all sorts of animals etched in there. And those animals you would readily recognize, and some of them look very similar to dinosaurs. It really is incredible. If you go down to uh, uh, Australia, the, the Aborigines had a a painting painted up of a creature that they hunted that they called Yaru, and I, I love this particular painting. Uh, it had killed one of their kinsmen. And if you look really carefully inside of its belly there, they actually drew their kinsmen in there. They were, they were hunting this creature. Now, this is a water creature, so by technical definition, it's not really considered a dinosaur. But uh, like I said, some of these uh, plesiosaur and, and flying reptiles are sometimes in a layman's sense lumped into, uh, you know, being with dinosaurs, even though they're technically not considered dinosaurs. Here's another one over at Angkor uh, uh, there was an ancient temple rediscovered there in Cambodia, and they've been cleaning it up. And there's, there's reliefs all over this temple. It's a huge temple complex. And uh, a number of animals are, are etched into this and, and kind of formed there. And some of them are, are absolutely fascinating. This creature here almost looks like a muzzled 
a stegosaur of some sort, uh, or at least something that would fit within that kind. Now, there's a, they've been going back and forth on the peer review process on this one, and uh, I, I think they said they found another relief that uh, actually looks similar to a stegosaur too, so I'm kind of excited to see what's going to happen with a lot of that. Uh, go to the Ishtar Gate in Babylon, built by order of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, in the Bible, had this uh, uh, gate built. And if you look at it, alternating up it, you've got this particular creature here and an auric, which is an extinct type of cattle. But uh, look at this creature. This thing has scales. You see that? It's got a reptilian tongue. It's got a hip structure so that it raises its body up off the ground. By technical definition, that's a dinosaur right there. We sometimes just glance over this stuff historically and we don't think much about it. If you uh, look at the uh, times of the Reformation, you might think of uh, Martin Luther, John Calvin. Uh, John Calvin came out of the Reformation, uh, one of the leaders in that actually, and he wrote a commentary on the majority of the Bible, and uh, he wrote it in Latin. Now, this is some of the artwork from when it was translated from Latin to English in the year 1578, and there were some things that grabbed my attention on this artwork. Uh, it was these three things right here. We're going to zoom up to them so you can see them a little better. There at the top middle, you have a couple of dragons. And, uh, you know, in part one, we actually talked about the connection between dragons and dinosaurs. Uh, we actually see uh, a lot of that historically as well. A lot of the descriptions of dragons are actually very similar to that of what we would call dinosaurs today. But uh, go down to the bottom middle, and this one's upside down, which usually signi signifies that it's dead. But this creature looks surprisingly similar to an ornithopod type of dinosaur. Now, here at the Creation Museum, if you go in the dinosaur den, it's the one area that's not fully handicap accessible. You have to go up some steps to see some of this. But uh, it's just a little area up there. It's got a number of different dinosaurs, some teaching on it. But as soon as you go up the stairs, most people walk right past it. It's really the very first one. There's a little ornithopod dinosaur to give you an idea of kind of what it would have looked like in there. If you look at some other literature, uh, Gilgamesh... Uh, he uh, killed an ancient uh, Babylonian uh, reptile-like creature. I mean, this is some sort of fascinating creature. If you look at the description, it's very similar to that of a dinosaur. But uh, it, it, it was a fascinating creature. It may well have actually been a dinosaur. If you look at Beowulf, uh, the old Anglo-Saxon poem, it relates uh, to events uh, going back, uh, you know, really in the, in, in the first millennium. But uh, Beowulf kills Grendel. Grendel is this dragon-like creature that had smaller arms, but it had a big claw on its arm. And Beowulf was famous because he, he, he attacked this thing and he, and he pulled the arm off of it. And it started to bleed and it went back to its lair. Well, they tracked it back there and they go in and Grendel had died, I guess from blood loss or whatever it might have been. But then when they get in there, they realize that Grendel wasn't alone. Grendel had a mother. And so they ended up killing uh, uh, Grendel's mother as well. Now, later in Beowulf's life, he ended up killing a fiery flying serpent where he himself sustained enough injury that he ended up dying from that as well. But what's interesting about uh, uh, this Grendel is that description of a dinosaur, shorter arms, big claw on it. We actually have a dinosaur called Baryonyx, which fits that description almost to a T. It is fascinating when you look at that. Uh, I mean, we have uh, all sorts of accounts. This is St. George and the dragon, a, a retelling of that one. We see uh, images of St. George slaying the dragon all across Europe. And, uh, you know, that's a fascinating account. Uh, you know, we see all sorts of these types of things. Fossils of baryonyx, as a matter of fact, have actually been found in England uh, as far back as 1983. They've been able to find some of these. So it, it, it actually matches uh, fairly well in that, those particular regions, finding these types of creatures. Now... One of the ones that, that I thought was cool, this was uh, over in France. Uh, the city of Nerluk, if I'm pronouncing that properly, was renamed Tarascon, if I'm pronouncing that properly. But uh, it was in honor of them killing a dragon there. And according to the description, it was bigger than an ox, a little bit larger that is, and it had a long, sharp, pointed horn on its head. Now, if you look at a number of different uh, ceratopsian dinosaurs, some of them have a three horn, some will have uh, variations in some of those horns, but it actually matches a description very similar uh, to one of the ceratopsian types of dinosaurs. If you go to uh, Ireland, an Irish writer about uh, AD 900 recorded an encounter with a large animal. That creature had a head shaped somewhat like a horse and had iron on its tails that pointed backwards. It had thick legs and strong claws. So uh, this dragon-like creature actually is very similar to something like a kentrosaur, stegosaur. They're probably all part of that same kind. Could have been a variation in that. If you go uh, to uh, Italy, you know, we find these things all over the world. And this is what's fascinating about some of this. Back in the 1500s, 
uh, in the city of Bologna. Uh, bologna is how we, you know, we, 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 we like to uh, eat, eat things like bologna. I know we pronounce things in a lot of different ways here. But uh, a peasant encountered a small hissing dragon. The man killed the animal by striking it on the head with his rod. Uh, he, bought, he brought the body to a famous naturalist. Uh, you know what? I'm probably going gonna to botch his last name here. Uh, but U- Ulysses Aldervandres, uh, if, if I'm saying that right. Uh, but uh, yeah, Aldervandres uh, carefully studied the carcass and reported that it was unquestionably a reptile, unlike any he had ever seen. It had a very long, slender neck and a thick body. The description actually fits that of uh, actually a fairly well-known dinosaur. It's a really long neck one. We actually have one of those uh, here in our uh, dinosaur den as well. Uh, Rampharynchus uh, is something very similar to what Herodotus was mentioning. Herodotus was an old Greek historian uh, uh, living several hundred years B.C. Now, what's interesting about this, he's talking about a place in Arabia, and, you know, I've read this count over and over again, and I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it every time. But there's a place in Arabia, not far from the town of Buto, where I went to learn about winged serpents. When I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small, and even smaller. Winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt. But the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and will kill them. Uh, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feather, but they're like the wings of a bat. I thought that's kind of interesting, you know, and that actually does kind of follow some of these descriptions of some of these flying reptiles. You know, we see uh, all sorts of petroglyphs all over the place. This one here, you can see a little bit better of an outline there toward the bottom of it. I mean, these things are fascinating. We find them all over the world. So I love seeing this kind of stuff. Uh, here we have a couple other creatures. One of them repeats the Yaru down here uh, in, uh, in Australia. But uh, this top one, uh, boy, you know, some of these names, I'm, I'm going to be honest, they're, they're tough for me to pronounce. Uh, Miriola, I believe is how you would pronounce this. A mighty creature resembling a plesiosaur is often reported in the Hawkesbury River near Sydney. The reports go back several centuries. Some estimate that the creature is up to 50 feet long, uh, which is just fascinating. But uh, yeah, the Aborigines talk again more about Yaru here. Bunyip. An Australian Aboriginal word for monster. The description and sketches resemble a large bipedal reptile. Uh, maybe not necessarily Tyrannosaurus itself, but some sort of one of those Tyrannosaurids, you know, which some of those were actually much smaller than even the T-Rex. Uh, Culta, another Australian tradition, speaks of an enormous plant-eating reptile. The animal had a small head at the end uh, of a long, narrow neck, a massive, bulky body supported by four huge legs and a long, pointed tail, similar to... Uh, accounts of Wanambi uh, from Northern Australia and Colleen and Mayendi from Victoria all seem to resemble variations in sauropods. And of course, you know, all sorts of creatures have died out over the years. And dinosaurs, we've seen those tend to die out uh, somewhere between the 15 and the 1800s is when um, the, the majority of those seem to be disappearing from some of the historical records anyway. Well, what about scientific evidences? Do we have any scientific evidences of dinosaurs or, or different aspects and elements that might be significant? Yeah, actually we do. Let me start with some red blood cells. Uh, red blood cells uh, don't last very long. If I were to cut myself and spit out some red blood cells, they're going to rot, decay actually quite, quite rapidly. In fact, it's difficult for us to keep red blood cells for long periods of time. Well, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, a paleontologist, and uh, you know, her team, they actually found a T-Rex femur out west. And this femur was down in a ravine. They couldn't get it out. Uh, so they actually brought a helicopter in. They're like, let's get this thing out. So they go to load it on the helicopter. It was too big. And so they thought, oh, what are we going to do? Well, they decided to do something that nobody had done before. They took that T-Rex femur and they broke it in half. And when they broke it in half, they come back to the lab. Well, hey, that's a great place to research. We've never really cracked open dinosaur bones like this. So what did they find? They found some preserved red blood cells. Now, these guys were in shock. They were like, Whoa! There is no way that red blood cells could possibly last 65 million years, 68 million years, whatever it might have been in their viewpoint. But they finally said, well, I guess red blood cells really do last 65 million years. So that was kind of the conclusion. Well, since that time, Dr. Schweitzer and a number of others have actually started to crack open different uh, T-Rex bones and other dinosaur bones. And uh, in, in Dr. Schweitzer's case, they actually found some soft tissue. Some of it was stretchy. This one on the far left side uh, of your screen up here, that you can actually find a video on the internet where they're pulling this and stretching it. 
It's just fascinating. You see a, a vein in here and some other soft tissue. But, uh, you know, people have been doing this now left and right. There's actually quite a bit of dinosaur soft tissue that's now been found. I know some creationists that cracked open a triceratops horn. And uh, what did they find? They found some, some soft tissue as well. Uh, if you look at this picture, I, I, I'm fascinated by this one right here. You're zoomed up. You're actually looking into a vein and you see crystalline material in there. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Mark Armitage and uh, Dr. Kevin Anderson. And uh, Dr. Anderson, I know, and uh, the Creation Research Society, they've been working with a big team uh, on an iDino project. Hey, you, you just can't beat a name like that. Investigation of dinosaur intact natural osteo tissue. Hey, brilliant. I mean, what are the odds that that would work out to iDino? But they have a project going on, uh, one and two, and I don't want to uh, you know, give you everything that these guys have done, but they have done an immense amount of research. And I would encourage you to go to the Creation Research Society and uh, find out more about what they have. That's on creationresearch.org. And they have a journal, Creation Research Society Quarterly Journal. This is a peer-reviewed journal where they've published a lot of the results that they've been finding on this. They've found quite a bit of uh, dinosaur soft tissue, which is just fascinating. It blows your mind how much is in there. They've also found radiocarbon in dinosaur bones. Now, that's significant. So why is carbon, uh, particularly carbon-14, why is that so significant in a dinosaur bone? Let me explain something from a big picture here. Carbon-14 is not supposed to last very long. Carbon-14 dating does not give anything like millions and billions of years for dates. That's actually some of the other dating methods, potassium, argon, uh, rubidium, strontium, uranium decay, things like that. Carbon-14 is used for stuff that's supposed to be a little bit closer to our time frame. It's got a half-life of about 5,730 years or so. Now, of course, we've not actually observed that. You know, this is our estimates based on uh, our measurements in the lab. But the point is, carbon-14 shouldn't last but more than about 50 to 100,000 years maximum. Even with different methods, AMS method or whatever it might be, I don't want to get too technical on you. But carbon-14 cannot last millions of years. In other words, if something has carbon-14 in it, it cannot be millions and billions of years old. Let me explain a little bit more about radiometric dating methods, particularly carbon dating. You have carbon-14. That's going to be uh, the, the parent here. This is going to be A. A is going to decay into B. Carbon-14 will decay naturally into nitrogen. And so we see that in bones, things that like plants or nuts, stuff like that, stuff we can pull out of graves that were carbon-based, essentially. So uh, let me explain a little bit more about carbon dating. Where, where does carbon-14 even come from? We get cosmic rays up there that actually have little neutrinos and things like that just zipping right through our atmosphere. Most of the time, it doesn't hit anything. But you got nitrogen up there. So you have a nitrogen, boom, one of these neutrinos comes by, hits right in the nucleus, and it sticks. Well, as soon as it sticks, it changes the atomic number. It is no longer nitrogen, now it is carbon-14. Well, as soon as it's carbon-14, it wants to bond with oxygen to make carbon monoxide or furthermore, carbon dioxide. Well, what likes to eat carbon dioxide? Well, things like plants. So you get a certain ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 in your plants. So it starts building up in there. Well, what likes to eat plants? Well, things like animals like to eat plants. So they start to eat the, these uh, plants and they take in a ratio of carbon-12, carbon-14. So how does a radiometric dating clock start then with regards to something like carbon-14? Well, let's say you're an animal like a cow here, poof, you die. You're not taking in any more carbon-14. So boom, it starts to decay. You find your bones here. And what happens is that carbon-14 over time starts to decay and it starts to go back into nitrogen. So as it goes back into nitrogen, you have a half-life and you get less and less of it. So as you follow the bones down here, you get to a point where you don't have too much carbon-14 left. Well, let's say you find that cow bone and you're like, okay, here's that cow bone. How much carbon-14 is in it right now? We can go measure that. We know that. But there's a lot of other unknowns we don't know. How much was in it originally? Well, we don't know. We actually make an estimate on that. Has the rate of decay ever changed? Well, we don't know. So ultimately, there's a few things in here that we don't really know because there's a lot of assumptions behind this. Could there have been some carbon-14 added by another means after the cow had died? Is there a means that took some of it out? What was it originally? We really don't know a lot of this. There's actually a lot of assumptions behind dating methods. Uh, initial amounts, parent or daughter added or removed. How's the rate changed? How, you know... There's a lot of factors involved in here. So, when it comes to carbon-14, you still can't be adamant that it's an actually an accurate measurement. 
But one thing we do know, if it has carbon-14 in it, it is not millions or billions of years old. So if you find a dinosaur bone that has carbon-14 in it, it cannot be millions and billions of years old. Well, what about those other methods? Potassium argon, for example. I'm not going to go into all the dating methods, but let's just look at potassium argon. Potassium argon is used on things like lava flows. It's not used on, on bones or, or carbon-based materials. No, this is used on something like a lava flow. It's, it's for rock. So you have a radiometric uh, uh, form of potassium. It wants to decay into argon. So you go to a, a, a volcanic eruption. As soon as that thing cools and solidifies, boom, that's supposed to start the clock. So geologists went out and sampled some of known volcanoes, places that we know exactly when they went off. Mount Etna, for example, we know when it went off. Mount St. Helens, uh, some of these places in New Zealand or Hawaii, we know exactly when they went off. They went out, they got some of their, their uh, cooled and solidified uh, uh, lava. It's now rock. And look, you get dates here that are all over the place. Some of these dates are way off. One of them at Mount St. Helens, the Lava Dome, 1986, it went up, cooled and solidified. They got some dates uh, upwards of two, 2.8 million years old. There was uh, one down here uh, from Hawaii, upwards of 15 million years old. The point is, if you can't trust it on dates you know, why would we trust radiometric dates on things we don't know? That becomes a problem. There's actually a huge study uh, instigated by the Institute for Creation Research, and I know uh, uh, they worked with uh, other creation organizations as well. And uh, they did uh, two volumes, Radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth. Two of those books, very technical books. Uh, um, I've actually read those books, and it's, it's incredible when you think about all the material that's in there. Uh, the good thing was I didn't read through it all at once. I went through here, I went through there, which was great. But uh, uh, Don DeYoung actually took a lot of that radioisotopes in the Age of the Earth information. He condensed it in more of a layman, easy-to-read, friendly book called Thousands, Not Billions. So if you want to know more about some of the problems with the radiometric dating methods, this is probably the book you want to start with and get in your hands, Thousands, Not Billions. Hey, when it comes to dinosaurs, what about all those dinosaur transitional forms? You know, we're in a culture that says dinosaurs evolved into birds. Of course, people still have no idea what it was that really evolved into all those dinosaurs. You go out and look at the fossil record, and, and this is what you see. This is what you see. See the red? The red is actual fossil evidence. So when you see this sort of thing, what you're not seeing are the transitions. Take note of this. Down here at the bottom, something supposedly evolved into all those. Do we find any fossil for that? No. Same thing with some of these other areas. We don't see the fossils that are evolving into this. What we see are the straight up and down, those verticals. What that means is you've got some variation within certain sauropods, variation within certain uh, tyrannosaurids and so forth. What you're not seeing are the transitional forms to get to those. We're not seeing anything that goes from dinosaurs to birds. We're not seeing anything that goes from previous reptile into the dinosaurs. And that's big. I've talked a little bit about some of the uh, alleged dinosaur to bird evolution in the previous talk, so I want to encourage you to go back to that if you've not seen that. Hey, what about the Ica stones? I want to hit some of the stuff that's kind of controversial. Some of the stuff that people go, hey, is this good? Is this not good? Ica stones. Now, Ica stones are fascinating. Uh, Ica is a city down in Peru. I've actually been uh, down to Peru to that area. I've went all around, but I've never actually been to Ica. Um, so I'm relying on some of the research from others. But uh, there's a number of stones that have been pulled out of graves in that particular area. And uh, there was a, uh, one of the uh, uh, guys that worked there actually has a huge uh, museum there. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. Javier Cabrera. And I believe uh, uh, you know, his descendants are actually in charge of this museum now. But he collected massive numbers of these Ica stones. Now, what's fascinating, down in Peru, you find pottery, you find textiles, all sorts of stuff that people have pulled out. And they have all sorts of animals on them. And in some instances, you find things that look like dragons and dinosaurs. And uh, you see this even at Cabrera's museum. Now, Dr. Cabrera uh, himself, he was not a creationist by any means. In fact, he believed in things like aliens and some sort of an evolutionary worldview. But uh, these were still fascinating even to him. Now, these became very controversial because in some instances, you find some creatures on there that look like dinosaurs. Now, in a secular worldview, that's impossible because dinosaurs were supposed to be gone a long time ago. And yet they find some of these rocks that had dinosaurs on it. And some of these have gone back, you know, into the museum for, you know, 60, 70 years, maybe even a little bit more than that. So, I mean, they've been around for quite some time. But here's where the controversy began. Guess what? There's a lot of people down in Peru that are not rich. 
Guess what? It's like that all around the world. But some of these people down there, they realized, hey, these Americans will buy a rock if I, put, if I put a dinosaur on it. So they started making stuff that looked like this. And they started putting dinosaurs on it. Guess what? People would start buying them. And so all of a sudden, you have authentic ones and you have modern fake ones. And so people have sometimes just jumped on the bag and like, well, it's got to throw them all out. You know, we got some fakes. Well, not necessarily. I think the key here is to be discerning with regards to, to a lot of these. There are authentic ones. There are some real ones. But usually you can tell them apart. You know, the old ones, they have oxidation, for example. You can see where it's been worn. Um, you know, in some cases, you can look and see if it's a false image. You know, certain eras of modern history, people were drawing uh, certain dinosaurs incorrectly. For example, they would have T-Rex standing straight up with his tail straight down. You know, so, I mean, you can look for some of those types of things uh, where people made it more modern. And you can sometimes just look right at it and say, well, that's a new one. You can tell. Uh, I want to encourage people, if they want to find out more about the Eka Stones, uh, Dennis Swift actually wrote a book, Secrets of the Eka Stones and the Nazca Lines. I want to encourage you to uh, consider uh, uh, that particular book if you want to find out more about it. But I, I think the key here is be discerning. There are some that are real. There are also some that are faked. The key is uh, looking at it properly. Well, here's a big one that hits a lot of controversy. What about human and dinosaur footprints? Ichthyology. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Ichnology, if I get, I guess, sorry guys, I just took a drink, um, is the study of footprints here. And one of the most famous spots that people would like to bring up is, hey, what about the Paluxy River uh, down in Glen Rose, Texas? I've actually been down there. I've walked the Taylor Trail. Uh, that was, I, man, I'm getting old. That was last millennium, the very end of it. But uh, yeah, you look down there and there were some prints that looked kind of like they were human. And you can kind of see them walking up through there. Now, they have all sorts of uh, dinosaurs there, uh, a lot of dinosaur footprints. There's actually quite a few right down in that whole general area. And they even have uh, uh, trails that you can go uh, check some of these things out. And we actually have a couple of copies of some of the dinosaur footprints even here at the Creation Museum from Paluxy. But uh, there was a problem. You go out to the Taylor Trail or the, or the shelf site, some of these places, they're not necessarily human footprints. And a lot of creationists agree, hold it, we have to be very careful of this. Uh, especially as, as people started looking at it. Because as you look at it, yeah, it does kind of look like human footprints. And they've been able to uncover different areas where they find more. But the question is, were they really human footprints? When you look at those prints, as, as they start to erode, they erode down into a three-toed footprint. So what you were seeing was more the upper part of a three-toed dinosaur's footprints as they stepped into the mud, and then they pulled out, and then they kept going. Okay. And so what happens is that mud starts to collapse back in. Uh, uh, creationist Dr. Emil Silvestru, paleontologist, uh, geologist, uh, actually he's not a paleontologist, he's more of a cave expert, more of a geologist in that area, but he, uh, he actually agrees, uh, a, a person who believes in more of the secular origins account, Kubain, uh, he, he found his interpretation of the indistinct elongated tracks from Paluxy River uh, as metatarsal dinosaur tracks resulting from mud collapse very plausible. So a lot of creationists have actually backed off of this, said, hold on, let's, let's be honest with this evidence. This may not be the best. So uh, some of those you have to be very careful of, and I want to encourage people, eh, let's not use that one as maybe one of these great evidences. Uh, there was another set that was claimed up in uh, Wolverine Creek up in British Columbia in Canada. You can see that print up there. You know, it's actually not as discerned as, you, as you know, people would hope. Uh, Dr. Emil Silvestri was able to check that one out as well. He said, personally, I lean toward uh, uh, interpreting these footprints here as metatarsal dinosaurian footprints too, although I would not completely rule out the possibility of them being human. But the point is, we can't really say for sure that those are human. So let's not say that. So we got to be careful of that too. Here's another one that stirred up some controversy. The Zapata track. Uh, this was documented by the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, it, it's interesting, uh, Dr. Jerry Ma, uh, uh, McDonald, uh, he's a paleontologist, you know, he was actually out there, he studied some of this. Now, he is an evolutionist, you know, so he wouldn't say that this is a human print. But uh, here's what was written up in uh, the article, Petrified Footprints on the Smithsonian by Doug Stewart. The fossil tracks that McDonald had collected included a number of what paleontologists like to call problematica. It means that there's problems with it. Uh, on one trackway, for example, a three-toed creature apparently took a few steps and disappeared, as though it took off and flew. We don't know of any three-toed animals in the Permian, McDonald pointed out, and there aren't supposed to be any birds. 
He's got several tracks where creatures appear to be walking on their hind legs. Others, the outlook almost simian. Now, do you guys know what simian is? Simian is, is something like ape-like or human-like. Now, in that article, they didn't actually have a description or, or picture uh, of this uh, alleged simian footprint. People have been out there and they've, they've taken pictures of it. Here's what it looks like, just to give you an idea. And at the same time, I'm showing you where that's found. These are found in Permian rock. This is clearly Permian rock. Permian rock is supposed to be even be before the dinosaurs, which is why they were having problems with the th three-toed footprints as well. Dinosaurs weren't supposed to be around at that time. Well, they continue in the article, uh, talking about this Zapata track. Uh, on one pair of uh, stilts, uh, stone tablets, I noticed some unusually large, deep, and scary-looking footprints, each with five arched toe marks like nails. I comment that they look just like bear tracks. Yeah, McDonald says reluctantly, they sure do. Mammals evolved long after the Permian period, scientists agree, yet these tracks are clearly Permian. So they were finding things that look like human, things that look like bear, things that look like dinosaur, and rock layers that weren't, they weren't supposed to be there. So that's a problem within that evolutionary worldview. Now, of course, people try to explain a lot of this stuff away. Uh, is this a human footprint? Hey, that's a great question. It looks kind of like a human footprint. Some people want to agree, some people don't. I'll leave that for you uh, to decide. Now, there are some uh, human footprints that people largely agree on. Uh, one of the more famous ones are the Laetoli footprints discovered in Africa. These have been known for quite some time. In the secular worldview, they say these went back 3.6 million years ago, long before humans ever supposed to have existed. But it's a little bit closer than something like Permian rock. So, you know, they, they allow this one to go ahead and go on through. And what they do is they try to interpret it by saying, well, maybe there was some ape, maybe like Australopithecine afarensis, you know, like Lucy or, you know, something like that, that had already evolved human-like feet, and they were the ones doing that walking. Now, people found other Australopithecine afarensis fossils, and they were clearly knuckle walkers, and they, they uh, had ape-like feet. They didn't look anything like human feet. But that still presents a huge problem here. Another set of human footprints were found in Crete, uh, they are actually supposed to be much older than the Laetoli footprints. They estimate this in the secular literature at 6 million years old. Um, and they largely agree these are human-like prints. And of course, they just say, well, maybe some ape-like creature had evolved human feet by then. That's just that common uh, ad hoc explanation, but uh, really doesn't explain it. Now, making sense of these, hey, people have been around since creation. Seeing human fo fossilized footprints places, that's not a big deal. But I still think we need to exercise caution. We need to, need to have some care. And we need to look at these uh, footprints and, and uh, be honest with this evidence. I know sometimes creationists want to jump all over this. Look, we've got this. This proves it. Well, guys, let's be careful about that. So I do want to exercise caution when looking at human footprints. And we're just, we're just scratching the surface here. Uh, but I do want to encourage people to research this subject in a little bit more detail. But one thing I want you to consider, too. Are we looking for the right things? Now I want you to think about something. When Adam and Eve sinned against God, God cursed the ground. Thorns and thistles came forth. Guess what? It didn't take long for them to figure out what thorns and thistles do when you step on one. So people started inventing shoes and sandals. All throughout the Old Testament, people wore sandals. In fact, a lot of times uh, in the Old Testament, you would exchange a sandal uh, when you had an agreement. Uh, we see some of that in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus wore sandals and so forth. Uh, you know, flipping over to the New Testament. So, yeah, people had shoes and sandals and so forth. So when we're looking at, at, at human footprints, are we looking for the right thing? There's this uh, idea, because we've been influenced by the secular world, that people ran around barefoot because they think man was primitive back in the past. But people have been brilliant back into the past. So, yeah, they, we, maybe we should be looking for shoe marks, uh, shoe settings, things like that, that we're not really looking for because it would give a little bit different impression uh, when you're walking. But those are things to consider if people want to study this subject. So dinosaurs, are they completely extinct? That's the question, isn't it? Rest in peace. You know, rest in peace is actually a Christian concept because those in Christ have peace uh, when you die uh, with the Lord. Those who are at war with God will not have peace, actually. But uh, rest in peace, I kind of Notice this. So are dinosaurs completely extinct? That's a great question. For me to say yes, I'd have to look everywhere in the entire world at the exact same time. And guys, I'm not that good. I'll be the first to admit that. So I'd leave open remote possibilities that they're hiding somewhere. Uh, you know, a lot of the old uh, dragon accounts and so forth, they were actually living in swamps, living underground. They'd come out only every once in a while. We've destroyed most of the swamp ground around the world. 
in the past, you know, four or five hundred years. So it makes sense. We probably destroyed a lot of their habitat as well. Most of those dragon legends ended with the dragon getting killed, by the way, too. But, uh, you know, as we look at dinosaurs, between the part one of this talk and part two of this talk, we've had a chance to look at dinosaurs from two different viewpoints. And, you know, when we start with the Bible, it actually makes sense of dinosaurs. It makes sense of dragons. It makes sense of petroglyphs. A lot of these different accounts. Uh, you know, we see the word dragon used in the Old Testament a number of times. And dinosaurs... You know, they were one subset of the many dragons that were out there. So it actually makes sense of it. And I want to I encourage people, use the Bible. Use the Bible as our absolute authority. Use that as a framework, as the glasses by which we look at dinosaurs. I really want to encourage people to do that. Now, as Christians, I'm talking to the Christians out there. How can you use dinosaurs? Now, I know a lot of people watching this uh, are Christians. There are people who watch it are not Christians. If you're not a Christian out there, uh, friends, I really hope really hope that you've been challenged a little bit by watching some of this. But I want you to understand, you know, some of this, these evidences, some of these ideas and arguments, some of that may not be perfect. What's perfect is God and his word. God is the one that's always right. And according to God, we are all sinners, and we're all in need of Jesus Christ, no matter what we look like, no matter where we live, no matter what our views are on dinosaurs, we all need the Lord. And I want to encourage people I want to encourage you to consider repenting of your sin and returning to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it'll change your life. But for those of you who are Christians, how can you use dinosaurs? Here's what I suggest. You can use them as missionary lizards. That's right. We can talk about dinosaurs, kind of like what I've done in part one and part two of this talk. We can use dinosaurs because we can go back and say, look, the Bible explains dinosaurs and makes sense of them. Guess what? The Bible also talks about the gospel. So you can use the, the dinosaurs as a springboard to then talk about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do that here at the Ark Encounter at the Creation Museum. We have a, a bunch of different dinosaurs in here, dinosaur dig sites. Uh, we've had dinosaur den, bookstore, a lot of things. And I know uh, exhibits are always changing as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's just fascinating when you see some of these things. But the point is the Bible's history is true when it talks about dinosaurs. It's also true when it talks about the gospel. There is no greater authority than God and by extension, his word, the Bible. So what kind of resources can you get your hands on, particularly resources that, that believe the Bible is true and use the Bible as a framework? Actually, we have quite a bit. First off, our website, answersingenesis.org, new lead article every day, whole section on dinosaurs. I want to encourage you to go there. We talk about the flood, and Noah's Ark, a host of different things that are actually somewhat associated with dinosaurs in, in many respects. Um, I do want to encourage you to sign up for a newsletter. Now, this is free. It comes out once a month. And uh, with, with regards to this, you can find out more about if we have a speaker in your area or updates on the museum or some of the latest resources. Uh, it, it really is fascinating. There are some good teaching points and teaching articles that appear in Answers Insider as well. Um, I also want to encourage you to uh, uh, perhaps donate to the Ministry of Answers in Genesis. Here at the ministry, uh, you know, it's that time. It's the like coronavirus time. And a lot of things have been shut down, and I want to encourage you to give to the ministry. I want to encourage you to give to your local churches as well, because these are hard times for a lot of us. And uh, I, I, would love, I would love for you guys uh, to be able to, to help us be able to help out our staff. We have so many incredible staff that have come from, from all over the world. And, uh, you know, we, we like to be able to take care of them, uh, especially in this, uh, this rough time. So uh, all we can do is appeal to God's people. And uh, also, I want to encourage you to be in prayer uh, about the ministry and our many outreaches. Uh, I know we've been doing a lot of different Facebook lives and so forth. I'll tell you about some of those here momentarily. Uh, but as for some of the specific resources, uh, uh, this is one of the older ones. I want to tell you about a handful of resources that sometimes you don't always hear about. Sometimes we like to give you, you know, the latest, the newest, some of these things. But I'm going to tell you about some other books. We have Dinosaurs for Eden uh, from Ken Ham. And uh, this is a fascinating book. I've always loved this book. Uh, even though, though it's an older book, it's a great book. You can learn a lot of facts and figures about dinosaurs. Another older book by uh, Dr. Dwayne Gish, who uh, went to see the Lord uh, a number of years ago now. But uh, he had a book called Dinosaurs by Design. And, uh, you know, these are books that heavily influenced me uh, when I was first diving into some of the, the dinosaur debate. 
I have a DVD, Dragons, Dinosaurs, and the Bible, which kind of combines some of part one and part two. But of course, if you watch the live streams, you're going to need a little bit more information. But these are, are excellent for studies in churches and youth groups and so forth. Uh, Dire Dragons, Vance Nelson, uh, Untold Secrets of Planet Earth. He actually runs through a number of different petroglyphs, a lot of different places around the world uh, that have some of these images. Uh, I only scratched the surface. You want to find out some more. Uh, Vance Nelson did an excellent job putting this together. Uh, Dinosaurs, Marvels of God's Design by uh, Dr. Tim Clary at the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, this one dives into a little bit more of the, the geology and a lot of the paleontology, a lot of the, the information, a little bit higher level, but at the same time, I would suggest a lot of kids, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old would have absolutely no problem and have a heyday going through this book. Uh, it really does dive you deep into this. Uh, Mike Ward does as well with his book, Dinosaur Challenges and Mysteries. And uh, we do not have this one on our website. I know you're sure, pretty sure you can get it on Amazon or some of these other places uh, as well. But this is an excellent book to find out a lot more about what's going on uh, with a lot of dinosaurs and a lot of different issues surrounding that. I have a book, Dragons, Legends, and Lore of Dinosaurs. We put together a, a handful of the petroglyphs, where is dinosaurs found in the Bible, some of these ancient accounts, and where you can find those. Uh, we also have Dinosaurs for Kids by Ken Ham. It uh, goes through the seven Fs of dinosaurs, formed, fearless, fallen, flood. Uh, the, so it's taking you through essentially chronologically through the Bible. At the same time, a lot of facts and figures about dinosaurs from a biblical viewpoint. For the littler kids, we have D is for dinosaur. It's a rhyme book. Uh, and at the same time, it teaches the kids the letters, but it's got the notes on how you train this to your kids and grandkids. Answers books for kids. We actually have eight volumes uh, now. Volume two, the second volume. Uh, specific questions about dinosaurs and the flood just from kids. These are excellent for devotions, by the way. We do have DVDs like uh, Dinosaurs, Genesis, and the Gospel for the Littler Kids. Uh, Ken Ham and Buddy Davis teamed up to, uh, to do this, filmed in front of kids for kids. It really is good. Answers books, volume one through four. We have chapters on dinosaurs, dragons, but also things like where Ken get his wife. What about racism? Why is there death and suffering in our culture? What about carbon dating? What about radiometric dating? If you want to dive into some of those subjects in a bit more detail, distant starlight, cavemen, alleged transitional forms, uh, climate change, these things are in here. Uh, a powerful set. Uh, flood of evidence. Uh, what about the flood and the ark? How do dinosaurs fit on the ark, for example? Glass House is our flagship book destroying an evolutionary worldview in a nice way. But at the same time, we're looking at it biblically. We're looking at it scientifically. We have an all-star cast on this. It really is an excellent book. World religions and cults. There's only two religions in the world, gods and not gods. If it doesn't come from God, it comes from man. That's humanism in its broadest sense. All other religions, all of them, one way or another, have humanistic elements that take people away from God and his word. So what this does is then it, it goes through those humanistic worldviews. What are they? How did they? And when did they deviate from God and his word? Incredible poster on that. But we hit somewhere in the neighborhood of about 60 world religions and cults. Uh, Answers books for teens, volume one and two. What about dinosaurs? What about Big Bang? What about millions of years? Uh, racism and death and suffering. In volume one, we have a chapter on sexuality. It's powerful in today's culture because so many of our kids have been influenced by the secular world. The fall of Satan, the fall of mankind. Why you cannot have death before sin? That's a huge deal. Satan could not have fallen between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. It had to be after Adam and Eve sinned against, or, or sorry, after uh, the declaration that everything was very good on day six. I doubt it was day seven because God sanctified that day and made it holy. But it had to be fairly soon after that because when Satan fell, he influenced the serpent to deceive the woman. So it was by that particular point. Confound the critics. How do you respond to nasty things you might see on Facebook or newspaper? Uh, these were actual letters that were sent to the ministry. Now, some of them are actually just good questions, but it shows you how to break them down and how to respond. How do we know the Bible's true? Uh, volume one, volume two. How could a loving God allow death and suffering? We see that in, uh, in DVD form as, as well. Um, inside the Ham Nye debate, if you're ever uh, uh, struggling to answer some of these skeptics that are out there, the same things that Bill and I brought up are the same things you're going to see left and right over and over again on debate boards and uh, places around the internet. This shows you how to respond to them and uh, how to deal with those arguments. Is the Bible true? How do you know? I would not suggest this be your first DVD. I suggest you get some of the other DVDs, some of the other books. This is a little bit higher level. It dives into some philosophy, but it really is a powerful answer. It also shows you some of the bad answers that Christians have given uh, when, they, when it comes to trying to answer this question. 
I also have the seven seas of history where I go through the whole Bible in one talk, the Tower of Babel. Uh, I love this subject. I have a talk on this as well. Why you should not take evolution millions of years and uh, mix it with your Christianity. That's in The Lie Evolution. And uh, the last couple of things I want to tell you about is the great dinosaur mystery solved by Ken Ham. Easy to read book. I'm telling you, uh, even preteens can read this book and uh, have absolutely no problem. And uh, my friend, Dr. Tommy Mitchell, uh, who died uh, this past fall, uh, you know, he uh, did an excellent DVD here, Jurassic Prank, uh, A Dinosaur Tale. So I want to encourage you to consider that. Now, I know I'm about out of time, but I do want to tell you briefly about uh, some of the Facebook Lives, some of the scheduled uh, events that we've got coming up. Uh, later this afternoon, uh, Leanne and Ken are going to be uh, talking about zebras, donkeys, and our own dwarfed miniature horse. So uh, that's going to be at 3 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. And uh, Ken's going to talk about the 4D theater this evening as well. Tomorrow, uh, every day at 10, actually, we've been doing live science with Roger. And I want to encourage you to consider those. Those have been hugely watched. Uh, so of the, uh, so of the uh, animal encounters as well. Uh, to, tomorrow at noon, Dr. Terry Mortensen is going to be talking about creation versus evolution. At 3 o'clock, uh, Leanne and Ken are going to be talking about porcupines. Uh, but uh, it's going to continue on through this. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but I want you to, to bookmark 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 7 o'clock. Those are the times when we do these. Uh, on Thursday, though, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Jennifer Rivera, we're going to do something a little bit different at the noon session. So we're not just going to give a lecture like we've been giving. Um, we are going to uh, kind of have more of a Q&A, and we're going to discuss a lot of questions, and we're going to have our phones up. So if you guys have any uh, questions, I want you to consider some of those and shoot some of those in, and we'll, we'll do what we can to try to answer some of that. But that will be Thursday at noon with Dr. Jennifer Rivera and myself, Bodie Hodge. Uh, at this point, I'm out of time. Uh, I'm going to pray. We'll finish this out. And uh, just God bless you guys. I really hope uh, you guys are having a great time uh, during uh, uh, this rough time of coronavirus. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you uh, for all your provisions. Lord, uh, help us just be still and know that you are God. Lord, I know when it comes to the subject of dinosaurs, there's so much we could talk about, so much we can learn. Uh, at the same time, Lord, help us be discerning. You know, some of these issues are, are tough to dive into. There's so much research and and uh, sometimes we, we don't know if we always get it all right. But Lord, uh, uh, when we come to this, Lord, help give us wisdom on the subject of dinosaurs. Help us stand on your word as the ultimate authority. Lord, if there's somebody that's watching this that's uh, not received you as Lord and Savior, Lord, I really pray you've been tugging on their hearts because it's all about you. Uh, let's not get distracted with the flood, the ark, dinosaurs, or all these little hobby horses without pointing people to you because it's all about you. Lord, uh, during this time of uh, coronavirus, I just pray you uh, keep Christians out there safe. Uh, watch over uh, this nation. Watch over the leaders. Lord, I ask for wisdom and guidance upon them. Lord, I uh, also want to pray for uh, uh, different leaders and uh, people all around the world. Lord, uh, bless them, strengthen them. Lord, I pray you watch over our various offices over in the UK, uh, up in Canada, down in Australia, down in Mexico, and down in Peru. Lord, bless them uh, during these hard times as well. And Lord, if there's any donors out there that uh, you just want to tug on them to, to give a little or give a lot, uh, we would really appreciate it, Lord. Lord, we ask for your, your blessing. And uh, Lord, we thank you most of all for sending your son to die in our place. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys.